Season 2 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. here from downtown, I noticed a lot of bike shops on the way. And then, of course, we see a lot of bike-centric things around right here. And I remembered, I thought to myself, geez, I, I get around Los Angeles on a bike. I, I should really be doing it here. You know, in your estimation, in your professional estimation, how much happier would I have been t- <laughs> riding a bike rather than taking the bus over here? Yeah, you would have been probably 200% happier. 200% happier. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely the best way to get around Portland. Mm. You know, Portland is relatively compact, particularly in the inner part of the, the city. And the riding a bike is by far the fastest way to get around. And I do include actually stopping at all the red lights when I say that. Mm-hmm. Um, because you can, in many cases, be in a bike lane and bypass traffic. Whereas, you know, on a bus, you're, you're in traffic. Um, and you have a lot more flexibility. Uh, you can really get just about anywhere uh, in, on a bike way, on an actual, in an actual bike lane or on a trail. And, uh, it's obviously really easy to just park right in front of almost every building has some kind of good bike parking. So it's mm-hmm. it's definitely the best way to get around. It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, sitting here in the central east side of Portland, speaking with Mia Burke, the CEO and principal at Alta Planning and Design, where her business is sustainable transportation, especially of the cycling variety. She is also, and I'm going to consult her book to get the exact title right, because I didn't want to mess this up. She is the adjunct professor at Portland State University, where she co-founded the Initiative for Bicycle and Pedestrian Innovation in the College of Urban Studies. There, I didn't mess it up. I knew I was going to forget a word if I didn't look at the book. The book, by the way, is Joyride, Pedaling Toward a Healthier Future. She's written that, and a lot of it is about the time she spent as the bicycle program manager of the city of Portland. Portland is a city that so many associate in their minds now with with cycling. When you got here, it was not that way, right? Right, exactly. You know, early 1990s, we had done a few things, and probably at that point, we're still ahead of most American cities, Mm -hmm. but we had a really long way to go. And what was happening at the time was there was kind of a convergence of a number of very positive things. We had a city councilman, Earl Blumenauer, who's a U.S. congressman since 1998. But at that time, he was a city councilman really focused on trying to make Portland a more livable place, and and he was very passionate about transportation solutions, including bicycling. We had a newly formed advocacy group, the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, that was pushing the city to do a lot more. There was federal funding that had been passed in 1991 that was trickling its way down to the cities. And Portland was really ready because Portland had been thinking about bicycling for a number of years. And then they had staff, um, myself included, that were really tasked with trying to create a bicycle-friendly future for Portland. Mm -hmm. So all that was converging at once. And so it was a very exciting time in Portland when we really lit lit a fuse and and sparked a revolution. Uh, We adopted our our, uh, bicycle, very visionary bicycle master plan. We started putting in bike lanes and trails and bike boulevards and bike parking at a really lightning speed, just as fast as we could go. And we started um, planting seeds for all kinds of encouragement activities and cultural changes so that people could really see the bikeway network as a way that they could actually get around on a day-to-day basis for whatever kind of trip. So we did a lot in the 90s. It was a very exciting time when uh, we got the ball rolling. And in the, be- in the beginning of Joyride, you, you talk about the, the early days, and you, you write about some moments of surprising, surprising, I guess, hostility towards cycling just on the street, getting shouted at and whatnot. That's, that, it's still kind of hard to believe. Uh, there, was, there was that much um, sort of floating animosity toward the cyclist in Portland at some point. You know, there's still animosity and there's still t- tightness out there. You know, let's face it, we're, there's stress when people are out on the roads, no matter how they get around. And particularly when people are in cars, there there is a uh, dehumanizing effect to the metal box that's around you. And those that drive everywhere tend to be very stressed. And there's a... Um, there's a tension between people that ride bikes and people that are in cars that plays itself out from time to time. Now, for the most, Portland is 
a place where there there is more niceness than there are in a lot of places um, on the roads. And you know, when you when you talk about um, you know, when people come to Portland, they experience that boy. The people stop for pedestrians, and they they don't you know cuss at each other, and they don't um, blow their horns as much as they do in other places. I think that's true, um, but I think that the the bicycling part of it has really evolved a lot. Like in the n- early 1990s, before we had, we really didn't have bike lanes on our roads, and there were very few people bicycling on most of those roads. And so that meant that anybody on a bike was just kind of sharing space in a, in a traffic lane. And there is a lot more ch- tension and hostility when you're sharing um, a travel lane on a busy road where there's a high speed differential. Mm. And the more you put in bike lanes and separate people on bikes and people in cars in space on busy roads. And then if you share, but you bring the speeds down of motorists so that it's a comfortable shared environment where the speed differential is low, Mm. then you reduce the tension. And then, but the other, probably the most critical thing that's happened besides the bikeway network is there are more people cycling Mm. and those people also, many of them, many of us own cars and drive as well. So the whole notion of you're a cyclist versus a motorist is um, blurred. You're a person and sometimes you're in a car and sometimes you're in a bike. So when you approach a stop sign and you're driving and you see a person on a bike approaching the stop sign, you just wave them through. Or if you're on a bike and you slow and you're prepared to stop, a lot of the time the motorist is waving you through, even though really it's your responsibility to stop. And that's because we're all getting around and we're all using these different modes at different times. And we've developed a real understanding and tolerance of each other that has definitely improved. Hmm. You describe this, this sense of taking away the sort of battle, the conflict of cyclist versus driver. You're one or the other, you, you pick your sides. It seems like people understand that, but when you, in in the way you describe the political processes that you've had to grind through and enjoy ride, the, Politics likes to likes to bring that divide back. If not any particular politician, the the system of the way politics works, in some sense, wants there to be two camps warring. Does it not? You know, I think a lot of it actually comes from the media. Mm. I think it's very the media drives a very simple antagonistic approach to this issue. So there have been ever since the '90s in Portland. And even today, there are constantly articles in the main paper and constantly news bits on television about the cyclist versus motorist hostility and problems that are out there. There's um, so much positivity, and there are so many people that drive, bike, walk, take transit, um, use all those modes, and, and the media kind of takes one little incident out of what has been, you know, a million happy and successful and safe trips that happened and on any given day, but the one that um, they saw or that you know created some controversy is going to be blared all over the, um, you know, all over the front page of the paper. So the media has has continually picked on this and made it so much worse than it really is. It's really a remarkable that most people get around quite safely every single day and that out of every single day if you're riding your bike or you're or you're driving you're going to have um you know dozens and dozens and dozens of positive interactions with other humans that are out there and in the course of that day you might have one see one bad behaving motorist or one bad behaving cyclist um and that's just the way it is and so to take that and blow it into a, a hostile thing you know, you know, kind of a psychological thing. We as humans go about our day, but if we see a cyclist, a single person on a bike do something bad, then we might take that and go home and complain about it. Or we might go to work and say, you cannot believe what I just saw. This <laughs> jerk just blew through the stoplight and, you know, they put their lives in danger and I can't believe it. Now, if you instead didn't say a word, just let it go. Just let it go because you also saw... Uh, probably a hundred cyclists not run red lights, but you didn't go and say, you know what? That was fantastic. At that stop sign, there were like 16 cyclists and they were just stopped and they were all chatting and one of them waved at me and that was super. You know, people don't tend to go report on the positive stuff that they see. And so my point is whenever, no matter how we get around, we can behave better, Mm -hmm. all of us. And we can all pledge to behave better uh, no matter how we get around. So if, if you're a person that drives or whenever you are driving, because we all get around by different modes, 
on different occasions. Mm. Whenever you're driving, make this pledge. I will obey the speed limit. I will stop for pedestrians and let them cross the street safely. I will drive safely and uh, peacefully around people on bikes. And when you're bicycling, mm -hmm. you can make a pledge that I will also stop for pedestrians and I will stop at red lights. And whenever any motorist does me the slightest shred of courtesy, I will smile and wave. And I do this um, all day long, every day, smile and wave, smile and wave. And I find that I get back so much kindness and so much joy in return. Um, it's like paying it forward every single day. Smile and wave, smile and wave. It works. Try it. How many of the projects you've been involved with in, as far as improving bicycle-related infrastructure or otherwise end up being, end up being could you put them as, as, as ways of, of incentivizing, of making easier good behavior on the roads? You, you describe lowering the average speed, the speed differential between a, a car and a bike and you know, even just bike lanes. I mean, these are, these are ways to make it easier to cooperate in some sense. How, how do you put that? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's a really good way to put it, that the, every time we put in a bike lane, it creates an opportunity for coexisting mm -hmm. on the roads in a safer and more um, cooperative manner because it, it, it provides space for someone on a bike. And essentially what the bikeway network does, what, what creating an actual network of bikeways does is it invites people to ride bikes. Mm -hmm. And when we don't have bikeway infrastructure in cities, we are essentially disinviting people to ride bikes. We are saying the roads, the system, the transportation system of this city is meant for people in cars. And you're not really welcome to bike. So let me give you one example of a way that creating the infrastructure incentivizes good behavior. So in Portland, we put in a trail, it's called the East Bank Esplanade, and it's along the river on the east side of downtown. And we also added a bike and pedestrian bridge to a, uh, a trail to a bridge called the Steel Bridge. And both those places, the trail and the bridge converge um, at a signalized intersection. And at, the, at that signalized intersection, when, all, when those two, the bridge and the trail opened up in 2001, all of a sudden there were thousands of cyclists converging on this intersection. Mm. And there was, it was very unclear as to what you were expected to do because you were maybe supposed to push the pedestrian button and use the crosswalks. Maybe you were supposed to sort of turn your bike in a weird way and get into the travel lane. Um, then you were supposed to maybe go north through what was a bus only lane, clearly marked as bus only. But if you wanted to go straight north, this was where you were landing is in this bus only space. Or maybe you were supposed to go in the car lane around the Rose Garden uh, Trailblazer Arena to, in order to get back to where you really needed to go. So go out of direction, which feels weird. Or you were supposed to go in this jig joggy way um, in another direction. So it was basically chaos. Mm -hmm. And so what happened? About 90 something percent of cyclists would have been considered um, in violation of the law. They weren't waiting for the red lights because they really had no indication of what they were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. The city of Portland, the engineers uh, took a, they got a grant and they did a study and they uh, got permission to put in a separate bicycle signal phase. Now in most American cities, we don't use a bicycle signal. That's a very European, very, very, very common European technique. You'll see it in every bike friendly city in Europe. And that is a signal with a green, red, and yellow ball with a bicycle in it. Very common in European cities, but very uncommon here. But the solution that they proposed is to put in a separate bicycle signal phase so that a person on a bike would come up and either push the button or trip the loop and be able to get their own phase to get across this intersection at a diagonal and then head through this previously bus only lane. They took that and transformed it into a lane that has uh, a two way bikeway to get through the arena area and straight north into the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And compliance with the signal went from almost nothing to about 80%. Mm -hmm. Because the infrastructure now invited people on bikes to come through here, uh, behave in an appropriate manner, use an appropriate um, signal, and flow in a logical way to where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're trying to do, not just here in Portland, but in every city that Alta works in, is to create infrastructure that makes sense, 
uh, and really works from the perspective of uh, everyone, whether you're on a bike or whether you're in a car. This works for everyone. It solves an issue that it seems like it's been, at least to my mind, a characteristic of American cycling. Even if you're on a bike every day, you encounter in many cities here in this country, you encounter many situations where you just don't quite know what to do. Uh, that's it seems like that was the main problem of cycling before is like, what do I do? I guess I'll just, you know, you're, you're always improvising, right? You're always trying to, trying to deal with, deal with scenarios. You weren't quite sure what the law was or what, what was safe. Just you're kind of muddling through. Yeah. You come up to a, a red light and how are you supposed, you're sort of unclear. You're sort of waiting at it, but the light doesn't turn green for you because you're supposed to, you can only trip the signal loop if you're in the exact right spot and you stay on it. Somehow you're supposed to know this. Mm-hmm. Um, or you're, you know, you're, you're not quite sure what the right route is. I mean, uh, and that, you know, so that's just really the, the goal of what we're trying to do in cities all across North America is to create conditions where bicycling can be facilitated as a normal, safe, convenient, and fun way to get around. Mm. And to do that, we have to provide infrastructure. It's like, it's like expecting someone to take the bus where you don't have a bus stop. (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, expecting someone to drive where there is no road or no bridge to facilitate getting across the highway or the railroad tracks or the river. If we don't put in good bikeway infrastructure, we really can't expect people to take bicycling seriously. Oh. So if you want to take bicycling seriously as a means of transportation, not just for the fit and the confident uh, who are willing to put on uh, Lance Armstrong, spandex, and buy a really expensive bike and barrel through traffic. That's one. That's less than one percent of any given population that has that kind of comfort level uh, on a bike. Mm-hmm. And that's who's bicycling today in most American cities. Mm-hmm. What we've also learned, though, is that there is a huge percentage in 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 most cities. We've learned this through focus groups and surveys and all kinds of data collection that there's a two-thirds or more that would like to bicycle more often. Many do bicycle recreationally, maybe on the weekends, maybe on a trail that's off the roads, but they are very concerned about safety and they are very, they really need it to be easy. They need it to be low stress. They need to feel comfortable, confident, and that's all about creating uh, safe infrastructure. That's kind of the first step. After the safe infrastructure is created, you also need to do a lot of work on a cultural level because we have we are all creatures of habit and we spent a hundred years uh, conditioning ourselves in cities to drive everywhere. Uh, we've, and we've done this through our, our building codes and our infrastructure that we've provided and our, um, our policies and our free parking that we provided every building and, you know, the car industry, et cetera, et cetera. And so in order to um, create conditions where people can bicycle, uh, and we also have to overcome habits. And to do that, we have to um, help encourage people to get started uh, by having all kinds of bike-friendly events and all kinds of one-on-one um, activities, uh, individualized marketing programs, all kinds of things to, to create, uh, really draw out the fun and the delight and the ease of cycling. You mentioned that Lance Armstrong spandex look. That the high public profile of that specific type of cyclist. Uh, that that's not. It's not doing cycling many favors, is it? Well, look, bicycle racing is fantastic, and the industry, the bicycle industry, would not exist if it wasn't for um, you know kind of the high end racing industry, both in mountain bike and and on road and cyclocross, which is lots of fun. Um, so I don't want to take away from that. It's it's uh, you know it is a sport. Bicycling is a sport. It's a it's a great, fun, delightful, high energy sport, and that is good. Bicycling is also a toy. It's also something that children do, and and they it gives them freedom and it puts a smile on their faces. What we have to do is create the impression that it's not just those two. We have to accept that those two exist, and that's okay. In fact, it's great because the bike industry. Um, we need the bike industry, and the bike industry has actually put a lot of money into realizing that if they create conditions for the average Joe Schmo <laughs> or Jane Schmain <laughs> to be able to bicycle on a regular basis, you know, in uh, just in regular average everyday clothing, yeah. that that's good for the bike industry. So we, um, we have a job to do, which is to um, allow for that image of Lance Armstrong, um, but also create an impression and create an opportunity 
for average everyday people to go by bike in regular clothing and get where they need to go and not feel that they have to change clothes and put on spandex. And I do mm. talk in my book a lot, particularly about women, this being a very big issue for women mm. and that um, the bicycling look that um, you know is kind of driven by the Lance wannabes with the, the Lycra shorts, the butt pad shorts and the nice. cookie shoes and all that stuff. You know, it is definitely holds it's it does hold people back because they they think to themselves, well, that's what cycling is all about. I got to jam my legs into these uh, really unattractive shorts (laughs) and, um, you know, get a bunch of expensive gear. And and that that is not um, that is kind of doing us a disservice. And so the impression that I that I try to create and that we try to work through in many, many cities that we work in is the impression of this is just the way we get around. You know, you can wear your skirt and your high heels and you can, you know, still look good, whether you're a guy in a suit or a woman on, you know, in cute clothing, going to pick up your kids, going to the grocery store, going to work, whatever it is, you don't have to put on this kind of racing look to get there. That's, uh, and and that again, it requires some real cultural work, um, you know, in different communities to bring that out. Now, you personally found out that cycling was was a form of transportation that, that you could wear non spandex taking before many Americans did. How how did you? Well, I started riding in Washington D.C., where um, the location that I picked to live just wasn't real convenient for taking the train there, uh, and it wasn't real convenient for walking. So I kind of got lucky because my brother kind of shoved his 10 speed Schwinn on me and said, you know, take my bike. And I was focused on environmental studies and he kind of shamed me into it. And I was a little overweight at that point. And so he, he, he said, you know, you're always complaining about being so fat. Why don't you get off your lazy butt and ride a bike? And you know, when siblings heckle you, I don't know, that's kind of a torturous thing. But, um, so I did start riding and I could barely get up the most pathetic hill when I started riding and, but I did, you know, I kept going and I felt within a couple of weeks, really, really good, really energetic and, uh, and fit. And, and I started losing weight, but more than the weight was that I started just feeling good. Mm-hmm. And so I, uh, at that point I had a car in, in Washington DC and I got a lot of tickets and then it broke down. And so I felt like that was just a sign that I needed to live a car free lifestyle. So I just really started doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found that it was a great way to get around and maintain my energy level and my fitness and my sanity and and all that was good being in graduate school. And then I started working for this nonprofit environmental group called the International Institute for Energy Conservation. And my focus was on transportation. And I went for four years to cities um, all around Asia, got to see a lot of European cities as well, um, learning about transportation and seeing that these very rapidly growing cities that were putting, that were following the American model of building roads and facilitating car travel for everyone were headed to ruin. We're, we're experiencing tremendous, hideous traffic congestion and air quality and safety problems. And that if you looked at the cities that were investing in rail and walking and cycling and compact land use, these economies were thriving and their uh, air quality was improving. Well, what were the cities that were impressing you in that way? They were mostly, you know, you see some of the Japanese cities and you see a place like Singapore, which has put a lot of energy into vehicle pricing. You see a city, Curitiba, Brazil. Mm. Then um, many of the European cities that I visited were Copenhagen and Amsterdam and Strasbourg, France. And um, many of the Swiss cities, many of the Dutch cities, many of the Norwegian cities. So the the um, and then of course of you were I was learning at the time about a, a little city called Portland, Oregon, uh, that was apparently doing some some creative things on thinking through the connection between land use, where we live, work, and play, mm-hmm. and transportation, how we get to where we live, work, and play, and really putting those two things together and saying, we this has got to be part of the same equation. And I started cycling um, both. So I, I saw this in my personal life, that it was good for me personally. I saw this in the world, that cycling was a piece of a larger puzzle, but an important one. And for me, the convergence of those two things was an aha moment where I decided that I, I wanted to dedicate my life to making American cities into places where people could ride bicycles for daily transportation. And I think to another aha moment in, in your book, Joyride, your, your arrival in Portland was like, it, was, it seemed like a revelation as you describe it. Maybe Portland was immediately apparent that this, this was the place for you. Is it, do I have that right? Yeah, it, 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 a lot of like stars aligned and 
and, 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 and all kinds of great things happened that made it clear that this was the place for me. And, and it's a, it's a, it's a great city. It's very progressive. And there's really a creative convergence of all kinds of beautiful minds working together on various aspects from food policy to transportation, to green buildings, to small business development. You know, there's all kinds of really rich, smart, creative souls working together here on various aspects of how we create, you know, a better future for our kids and our grandkids. You mentioned European cycling uh, road technology, like the, the lights dedicated to the cycle crossings. And you mentioned the, the city of Copenhagen, which is a city many cyclists bring up as, as a shining example of, you know, why aren't we doing it like they do it in Copenhagen? In the book, you, you mentioned Copenhagen's, uh, there's, this, there's this code of essentially an anti-spandex code you replicate in, in your book um, about dressing sensibly while cycling. What is it, wh- why, why are European cities like that so far ahead? How did they get so far ahead with cycling? Well, they started in a different place. You know, these are very much older cities and they, they didn't grow around cars initially. They were, you know, obviously much, much older. And so the, what happened in many of these cities, particularly like Copenhagen and Amsterdam, is that in the post-World War II period, there was an, on, an influx of automobiles and um, a pressure that was, you know, really driven by a lot of the American automobile industry um, to be car oriented in these European cities. And they, the impact on these very old cities was terribly, terribly negative. I mean, terrible air quality problems and terrible congestion. And really there was a revolution that happened in the seventies. And that was an anti, you know, the green movement and kind of an anti-car, uh, revolution in, in Copenhagen in particular, where thousands and thousands of people came out and said, we can't have this. It's, it's destroying our city. It's blackening our our old buildings. It's cre- it's making it impossible for freight to be delivered to buildings, mm-hmm. and it's not what we want. And so they pushed to get back to where they had been, where cycling was the priority, um, and cr- started creating the bicycle friendly infrastructure. And I first went to Copenhagen in the late '80s, and then again um, in the '90s a couple of times, and then back again in 2008. And and I think what impresses me the most is they didn't stop. I mean, they didn't once they hit already having 20 something percent of daily trips made by bike. They didn't consider that done. They just considered that a starting point, and they continued to add more and more infrastructure uh, to the point where today it's something like 36 trip 36 percent of daily trips are made by bike. In, in a beautiful, very modern, very uh, economically thriving city like Copenhagen. And it's, it's just, it's just uh, it is a model. I also think that from a traffic engineering perspective, um, Copenhagen provides a lot of lessons because it's, it's very, dri- they're very driven by safety studies as we are here in the United States. Um, they really study the heck out of everything. And they ch- have a very consistent and logical way of doing uh, traffic engineering. So traffic engineers like that. They like things that are orderly and you're following the standards and, it, you know, it's, it's all here prescribed in this manual. And, and, and that's why Copenhagen provides, you know, a tremendous model for us that we can learn from. And now I should say we're not going to become Copenhagen in any American city. We are not Copenhagen. We're not Amsterdam. We are who we are. And every city in, in North America is different. We all have to start where we are and create conditions that make sense and within any given city, you could have, you know, a hundred different neighborhoods, uh, hundreds of different neighborhoods with different conditions. And there is not one size fits all solution. There, there's a lot of stuff in our toolkit. And what we like to do is take that toolkit and apply the right tools to the right places in order to create the conditions that make sense for that community. And that's what we're doing in, you know, cities from Los Angeles to uh, all over the East Coast, all over the Midwest, and many of the communities are working here on the West Coast, you know, down in the South, the Southeast of the United States. I mean, we're really working in, you know, hundreds of communities, some small, some large, some rural, some urban, many suburban communities as well. We've got beach towns, we've got mountain towns, we've got tourist towns, uh, you know, we've got industrial parks, we've got a lot of private uh, kind of uh, office parks that we're working in, mm. you know, a lo- working at a lot of individual school levels, all kinds of, you know, just anything you can think of, of a place that you are going uh, might be a place that you could think about substituting a trip. Mm. Now, now, given the, the variety of American cities that you work in and, and think about the cycling potential of, how much 
Okay, can you ever look at look at a European city like a Copenhagen and say, you know, there's an element we could bring over, or is it always a matter of saying, well, cool, they've they've done it right. We just need to we need to emulate how they think about cycling more so than what they're doing about cycling. Does that make sense? Well, I, I, the answer is both. Mm. We 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 definitely can think a lot. How are they thinking about cycling? But we can take those techniques and adapt them to the American context and apply them as appropriate. Not every little, not every single solitary thing, yeah. and certainly not every single solitary thing today. But um, we have. And so in the 1990s, I went to Europe on a fellowship and visited 18 of the most bicycle-friendly cities and brought back a lot of ideas. And those included bicycle signals mm-hmm. and colored bikeway pavement markings and advanced bike boxes at intersections so that cyclists can be ahead of motorists when the light turns green, shared lane markings, uh, signage, fantastic signage that really is wayfinding signage to tie the whole bikeway network together so you can know where to go, how to get there on a bike. Um, And I took all these ideas and brought them back and started... um, studying and analyzing and and picking and and working with engineers and working with politicians and citizens to see which ideas made the most sense and how we could apply them in the American context. And it's taken, so that was 1996. So here we are, you know, almost 20 years later, 16 years later, and we're, we're, we've applied almost all of those techniques um, in different ways. Some of them have penetrated to the national standards. Some are still going through the process of getting into the national standards. Um, but we found that we can definitely take all those safety techniques and apply them and adapt them and use them while at the same time retaining who we are essentially as Americans, whether we're Los Angelinos or Portlanders or, you know, New Yorkers, there's, uh, we have to allow for the differences between us. We have to, um, create conditions that make sense for those individual communities, but the, and, and, and that, in that sense, allow for evolution, we one thing that we um, are we're constantly evolving what we're doing so that we are learning and creating safer conditions and better conditions. The more we get people to ride bikes on a daily basis, the more that we're going to learn and be able to make those conditions better for everyone. Now, when you're in a city you've never been before and you you get on a bike and you just you start rolling, what do you notice first? What do you look for first? What do you what do you try first to just gauge what the riding is like in that city? I have had the opportunity to be in, you know, hundreds of cities. And in particular, in the last two years, I went on a tour for my book. So I I was in 60 communities in in less than a year. And it was really cool to every single one of them. I got on a bike and it was uh, really, really neat to see all the differences between these communities. And, you know, I think for I'm looking for the good, the bad and the ugly. You know, that's really the truth. And that's what I ask for is show me what you're proud of. And show me what what's in progress. You know what's happening that you're excited about, where you see the opportunity, and show me where you've really got a challenge. Mm-hmm. And and that challenge is a uh, is probably going to be a bridge or an overpass or something that railroad tracks, something that you just can't penetrate, but you really you need to. Otherwise, it's going to be a barrier that can't be mm-hmm. overcome, and you're not going to get people to bike. So, you know, show me show me what you got, um, and give, you know, what I, my brain does immediately is start problem solving. You know, so every road that I look at and every barrier that we run across or every piece of land, every place that's going to develop in the future, you know, I kind of see it as, um, a canvas and there's something there. It's like a mosaic that I want to rearrange and I don't want to rip down necessarily everything. Sometimes some things you want to rip down, but some things you just want to tweak and rearrange and go around and some things you want to uh, take what's there and make use of that space much, much better than it is now. Mm-hmm. And some places you want to, you definitely want to say, boy, this needs a major overhaul. And so that's, uh, you know, kind of how my brain is working is, is this is a mosaic today. And how can I rearrange this so that in the future, it's something that is attractive and safe and beautiful. And the ideas of, of, of what is possible to, re- to rearrange, I mean, those have become very clear in your mind, I would imagine, whereas for, for cycleists or even politicians in these places or, or anybody, people don't really know what's, po- what's possible, what's hard, what's easy, it seems like. I mean, obviously, you'll know more because you've been in the industry for so long, but, but 
is, 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 is it true? Do people have a hard time? You have to explain first, well, you might not think this is easy. This is actually kind of easy to change. This is harder than you think. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. You know, change is hard, period. This is one thing I have learned definitively is that no matter what it is that you change, it is hard for people to uh, envision change. It's, um, you know, unless you're really kind of in a creative field of landscape architecture, architecture, urban planning, it's engineering even, it's hard to take what's there and envision something different. It is hard. So that, you know, that is reality. And, and, and there are also, you know, people become very accustomed to their ways. And so it's very, it offends people. Some people, not all, but some people get very offended by the notion that you're, that you want to change things because on some level you're telling them that they need to change Um, and they don't want to be told they need to change. They have to come to it themselves. They have to want to change. So we, we actually don't make very much progress where we try with shaming. You can't really tell people you drive too much or you need to lose weight or you need to be more healthy or you need to think this way. It doesn't work very well. Instead we have to create conditions where it's, delightful. And we have to create examples where it seems really attractive. You know, hey, the party's over there. I kind of want to go see what's going on. And, you know, my my mom and my neighbor, my colleague, my friend, boy, they, they've been riding their bikes and they look really good and they're having a good time and they're smiling. And, you know, what, what do you mean you're going to go ride your bike to work? How can I, can I come along with you? Can I get a, you know, can I get to get in on the act? So that's a different <laughs> way of looking at it. Um, and yes, when I look at streets, for me, there are, uh, I can very easily visualize how the street can be reorganized Mm -hmm. to have space for bike lanes or what we call cycle tracks, which are more separated. If I look at quieter streets, residential streets or streets that are sometimes in business districts, I can really envision how we can make this a more comfortable shared space. Um, that is very hard for those that kind of aren't in the industry to get. And a lot of the reason that it's hard is if you haven't experienced it yet, it's very hard to visualize it. So if you're in a community that has no bike lanes, it's very hard to visualize what streets would look like with bike lanes. If you're in a community that has no bike boulevards, which is um, what we use, the term we use, or neighborhood greenway, for a very low volume residential street where we've reduced motor vehicle speed and volume and created a uh, and a beautiful shared space where you can coexist. Um, very hard for people to visualize because those of us that drive for every trip are probably never going to have experienced a condition like that because they drive on major roads. So why would they have had the experience of getting out of their car and riding on a, a residential street that has had all these um, interventions done to it? It's, it's very hard. So what we we try to do is... The best way to teach politicians or leaders or engineers or or stakeholders about what we're trying to do is to bring them on a bike trip in a place that is bike friendly. So that's why we started the initiative for bicycle and pedestrian innovation at Portland State University. Mm -hmm. And also through First Stop Portland, which is a tour center at Portland State University, we host um, delegations from all over the world almost every week. And we put them on bike and we give them a tour and their eyes get opened. You know, I was giving a tour last summer to the, the what was the, the mayor of Denver, who's now the governor of Colorado. And the, you know, his eyes just lit up and, and his ability to grasp what we're doing completely changed. Same thing with the mayor of Sydney, Australia that I um, brought around. They're doing some good stuff in Sydney. So um, that's the first is bring them on a bike trip. And one example I'll give is we had a, uh, we were working on a bike plan at Orem, Utah, mm-hmm. not a terribly bike friendly place, lots of trails like off road, but in the town of, of Orem, they had not connected up all the trails or done any bike lanes. And we produced a bike plan, a draft bikeway network map. And the city engineer was really alarmed looked at it and immediately started marking it up going, Oh, we can't do this. We can't possibly do that. We can't, Oh, that's really no way that's too forget about it. And by the time he was done marking up our draft plan, which was a long-term plan, it was like a 30 year vision. Um, he had one, there was one bikeway in the North South direction, one bikeway in the East West direction. That was all that was left on the, the vision. What was wrong with all the rest of them? You know, well, we can't possibly, well, we couldn't possibly trade off a travel lane. We couldn't possibly trade off parking here. You know, this one's got a barrier. This one's going to be too expensive. All the normal reasons that are barriers for people in their minds. 
But really what the issue was is they just did not have bike lanes in Orem, and it was very hard for him to visualize what that was going to look like or feel like. So we invited him and a delegation to Boulder, Colorado. So in a day, we had the mayor and we had a bunch of city council people and we had the chief of the fire bureau and the police bureau and the parks bureau and some uh, community leaders, some business owners, and the city engineer. And we brought them to Boulder, Colorado, which is a phenomenally bike-friendly place. We had them all on bike. And we and I'll tell you, we, when we started off the ride, the very first question I got was, now what are these number thingies on the uh, handlebars? You know, those, that's the gear. So we were talking about... Starting from square one is what we can say. Square one, yeah, that we had people that had not been on a bike since they were a kid and they weren't familiar with even how to use gears. Mm. Okay, and this is normal. We just really have to be recognize that for many people, getting back on a bike when they're an adult is, um, it's a whole different experience. It really is. Mm. So we started pedaling and it took less than an hour and I pedal up next to the, uh, the, the public works director, the engineer and say, so what do you think? And he goes, Oh, you know, I, I have no problem with any of this. I, I, you know, it's going to be fine. And we got, and we get back to, they get back to Orem. They, and within, uh, a few months, they've got bike lanes in Orem. Are not just the, adopting the plan, but actually putting in bike lanes. And the bike and lanes are, are there and they're usable. There. They're yeah. usable. And so it really, it takes experience to get over some of these emotional hurdles and, and get people comfortable with what it really means. Well, what, what do you notice about the, the moments, these, the people of these delegations, when they really get it? What, what, are they, what are they experiencing specifically? Is it just they're like, hey, I'm, I'm moving along pretty fast, or I'm getting, this is, a, this is a pleasant ride, or, hey, I actually, I can figure out how to do this, I can see how, what, what, is, what, is, what really lights them up to begin with? One, they are smiling. I mean, uh, you know, it, it feels good. It feels good to ride a bike when you're a kid, and guess what? It feels the same when you're an adult. Yeah, it feels, well, I'm preaching to the choir. Let me feels, tell you. Yeah, it feels fantastic. So there's a joy, there's a delight that um, you know makes them feel like this is good, you know, mm-hmm. and this is something that I want other people to experience because it feels good. And so that's one. But the second is, particularly a lot of politicians, what lights them up is they can in their minds and visualize a solution to a specific problem that they have in their community. Mm-hmm. So they're thinking about that really congested road, or they're thinking about that. Um, new office park or that new residential area or something that um, people complained about. They have a lot of complaints from constituents in a neighborhood about how fast traffic goes through their neighborhood street. And so they start to, in their minds, go, oh, here's what we could do. We could take that problem and we could solve it by putting in uh, this traffic diverter that will shift some of the traffic to a, a more appropriate location. And we could put in some speed bumps, some signage, some uh, parklets, some greenery, and we can make this street into a place that is a very delightful shared space. Or we could take this really busy road and we could reorganize it so that there's a dedicated cycle track and, and they can see that the businesses are thriving here. They can see that motorists are getting to where they need to go. They can see that people aren't crashing into things. They can see that there's a lot of people on bikes that are very, that are, you know, normal looking, average everyday humans getting around and they can see it. And it all kind of clicks for them and they go, oh, we can do this. Mm. Now, I mentioned I myself getting around Los Angeles where I live, the, the bicycle is the main way I do it. And I want to know what you're thinking about North American cities like like Portland or or Los Angeles. You know, how much is how much of the the identity of the city is involved in sort of the way the way to improve the cycling conditions? I mean, how much how much of it is like well this this is this is a city this is a city that is like this. Um, what uh, what does that mean for how people bike through it? That sounds a little bit vague, but do you know what I mean? Well, I'll give you an example. I was uh, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and this is a, a very car oriented city where every just about everyone grows up driving for every single solitary trip. That's the way people get around. Mm-hmm. So, but things are changing in Dallas, and they built a light rail line, and they um, put in a trail that's only three miles. And it's on an abandoned railway called the Katy Trail. And it goes from uh, a private university to the downtown right to the American Airlines Center where the Dallas Mavericks play basketball. Mm. Lots of people use this trail, but it's only three miles. And so once they get into downtown at the American Airlines Center, they're kind of like, now what do I do? I just turn around and go back? (laughs) Oh, okay. So the a number of the leaders 
said, gosh, we want to be able to keep going. Right. What, what do we do now? And so I, I got to work on a plan for the uptown and downtown to create a network of facilities in the uptown and downtown. And initially their concept was, is going to be a, a seri- what they thought of in their heads was trails and the trails are going to be like this abandoned railway where it's completely off the road, but we're talking about roads. There, there are no more abandoned railways in the heart of the downtown. Mm-hmm. And so that was not going to really work. And so we started pulling out the tools in the toolkit. Okay. We could do traditional bike lane. That's a line on the road. It's just a line. It's relatively easy, low cost. You'll have to squeeze some space out of other travel lanes, maybe trade off parking, but technically speaking, relatively easy. Or some of these streets we could turn into more of a shared use environment um, by lowering travel speeds. Or we could do more of the uh, cycle track, the Copenhagen model, where you really are taking uh, quite a bit of space and dedicating separated by space in the in the public right of way, but it really is separated. And when we trotted out these options, what we heard in hey, this is Dallas, Texas. People drive, okay? <laughs> they just said this is this what this is how it is. This is how this it is. is how it is. Mm. It, if we're going to make it safe for people to ride bikes, mm. we can bike lanes are not going to work because mm. people are just going to drive their SUVs right over those bike lanes. And with shared use environment, forget it. That is just right. not going to work in Dallas, Texas. We have got to have separation. And if that means we trade off some parking or some travel lane space, then so be it. That is what we've got to do. And they were really set on it being appropriate to Dallas that we, this is such a car culture that we're going to have to, um, take, you know, take it, take it seriously in order to create the space. Now there's other places where I've recently been, uh, like, uh, outside of Boise, Idaho in a really, um, suburban community called Nampa. And in Nampa, there's quite a lot of infrastructure of pretty low volume suburban type of streets, but they kind of connect up and that it wouldn't take very much to turn these into what we call bicycle boulevards. Um, and they just wanted to start there. They felt like it's low hanging fruit. It's not controversial. It'll work. Uh, and that's where they wanted to start. And so they've already put together a fantastic network of bike boulevards. People are using them. Um, and so it really is a matter of um, working with the community to find solutions as to where to start mm-hmm. and apply those solutions. And then probably the most important thing to do immediately after whatever it is that you do is get people riding right, right. immediately. Like, don't wait, <laughs> don't wait for this just to happen. Right. You need to get people out riding because that's the way you build momentum for the more challenging uh, parts of the bikeway network that are likely to come. And getting people riding, I mean, what, what, what are some effective ways you've found that places do that? There really are, um, there's like a several very effective techniques. One is big events. Mm. This is like the Ciclavia in LA. Oh yeah, I love that. Yeah, so it's the Ciclovias that are all over the place and, and LA has had some of the most successful ones. These big events that get people out experiencing the public right of way by foot or bike in ways that they have never before really opens their eyes and they want to keep going. I mean, the next day they're like, nah, that was so great. It felt so awesome. How do I do it again? And so that's one is big events. Another is what we call individualized marketing programs. This is uh, Portland's brand is smart trips. There's a really effective program in Marin County, California called way to go. Uh, there's really great programs up in King County that we're, we're running. And these programs take, you take swaths of the city or the town And you send information to their house, like a survey, and you say, what would you like information about? Bicycling, walking, transit, carpooling, working at home? Uh, And we find that a lot of it's just people don't have the information. They just don't know what the bike routes are, and they don't know uh, how to get where they need to go. And so we try to lower the barriers to entry. And we deliver to their doorstep a bunch of information customized to their needs. And then we blitz the area with a ton of bike events and walk events and activities at the schools, at the farmer's markets, at the churches, at the grocery stores, so that they can learn and get invited to enjoy this and experience it. These programs are extremely effective. They are uh, for about 20 to $50 a household. We shift more than 10% of drive alone trips hmm. to bicycling, walking, or transit, and it sticks. People, once they get started, they tend to keep going. 
So individualized marketing programs. And the third really effective program is Safe Routes to School. Mm-hmm. And that is because tr- we, tra- we start to change a whole generation of kids to just think it's just, hey, this is just how we get to school. We right. bike and walk. And not only is it the kids, then their parents start to think, well, we bike and walk to school on you know Mondays and Wednesdays. That's the days we can make it work for us. And then not only is it those parents that are biking with their kids, but the community starts to see people biking with their kids. And nobody wants to hurt anybody that's biking with their kids or any right. kids. So the neighborhood around the school becomes a lot more tolerant of people on bikes and foot. So Safe Routes to School programs really stick. And then the fourth really effective way of getting more people riding is to create bicycle share programs. Oh. And uh, I have a, one of our, uh, my other company is called Alta Bicycle Share, and we operate Capital Bike Share in Washington, D.C. and Hubway Bike Share in Boston. These kind of large scale, individ- it's a transit mode where we have kiosks of bikes um, all over the city that you can check out for less than 30 minutes, return at any one of the kiosks. And it has overnight in Washington, D.C., created thousands and thousands of happy, healthy um, bike trips on these candy red bikes. Um, and it's completely gotten into the motorist perspective that there are people on bikes everywhere. Right, right. Um, and maybe I'll do that myself. Yeah, I, I think of the the, the system in, in Mexico City. They have a similar one. Exactly. And I, I, it makes me wonder. I mean, when you get a certain amount of people out there on bikes, like in Portland, you see they're visible. You know, you do that. That itself is an incentive for people. Um, you, you get like a, you get a certain amount of people just visible. Then that, they they the sight of that brings people on onto bikes, right? Exactly. And mm. there are if you'll ask people um, why'd you start biking, you'll, you'll hear people say things like, "Well, you know, I was sitting in traffic and I watched all these people on bikes zoom by me in the bike lane." And, uh, you know, I just thought I'd try it. You know, that, that, that definitely yeah, I'm zooming past it's, oh, they're getting there. They're past. getting there. They're getting there faster than me. And boy, you know, and my doctor told me I needed to, you know, lower my blood pressure and, and, uh, you know, lower my cholesterol. And I, you know, I need to get exercise. And I guess I figured that I might as well get there by bike. If I'm going to the gym anyway, maybe I should ride my bike to the gym. So, right. you know, it's, it's part of a psychological evolution is, and we need to have those that are driving, see people bicycling because it, that's the way that we open their eyes and open their hearts and minds. That's why the ciclovias are so effective because they can, they do it. It's a party. It's a big fun party, but parties make people happy and then they want to keep having that kind of, so if you can have a little party as part of every day, (laughs) isn't that something that you want to do? I, I agree. And you know, uh, finally, just it, it, being in this in, in spirit of cycling, I, I'll, I'll ask you this: you know, for anybody who is like me, just landed in Portland and in, in your beloved Portland, Oregon, and they they want to explore and they want to ride a bicycle, perhaps they'll rent one or what have you. What do you suggest? How do they? What What would you tell them to to uh, to help them best explore Portland on a bicycle? Uh, well, for sure, go just go online and, and Google bike rentals. There's three or four shops that rent bikes, and they're all going to give you maps. And um, there are a ton of If you go online to our initiative for bicycle and pedestrian innovation, we actually have a whole bunch of bike tours laid out um, that will, you know, you can see kind of like if you're a policy wonk or a transportation geek, you want to see the the cool facilities, you can follow along the transportation geek bike ride. And (laughs) if you just want to flow along, there's um, there's a number of trip planners. The city of Portland's website has so much information, you'll kind of be blown away. Um, by all of the different uh, rides and rentals and shops and stuff that you can experience. Then finally, I'll actually just plug a new book that is coming out this week, and it's called Where to Bike Portland, Best Biking in City and Suburbs, uh, put together by a company called World Bicycle Relief that does, or sorry, they, that, that works with World Bicycle Relief that does these kinds of books um, there's an app that goes with it, and it has um, tons of bike rides and family-friendly, fun, low-stress bike rides um, to kind of get people in the mood of seeing all different parts of the city by bike. Yes, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, right now Where to bike Portland, Portland, best biking in city and suburbs. I've been sitting here at the uh, the headquarters of Alta Planning and Design in the central east side of Portland, Oregon, speaking with CEO and Principal Mia Burke, also the author of Joyride, Pedaling Toward a Healthier Future. Mia, thanks so much for taking the time to talk about cycling today here in Portland. It's been a pleasure. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks.
And special thanks to everyone who backed this season on Kickstarter. Danny Bolson, Brad and Laramie on Movies, Paul Doyle, Humberto Grant, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Mary Gillander, Eric Graham, Will Graham, John French, Andrew Philippon Jr., Kimberly Hahn, Chris Kay, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Rebecca O'Malley, Michael O'Regan, Gail Poole, Blake Riley, Superfan Giovanni, Aiden Nullman, Adam Schaefer, Rob Schultz, Scott Schenker, Cam Smith, Kevin Smokler, Adam Sutherland, TSD, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.